Okay, welcome to the Sumer Sports Show. I'm here with the Sumer Sports CEO, Thomas Mitchoff. I'm one of the VPs of Sumer Sports, Eric Eager. I'm a little under the weather today. I was questionable coming in, but my model said, you know, my model puts me at about 0.85 times my normal ability, which, you know, the people in the peanut gallery would say, uh, you know, 0.85 times zero is still zero. So, uh, I, I'm going to make it. Thomas is 100% today, so you're going to get full Thomas today. Uh, but yeah, uh, happy Monday. Our first Monday without football in forever, right? Because we had the national championship game a couple weeks ago. We had Super Wild Card Weekend. We had two games last Monday. We don't have football now for six days in a row, Thomas. Uh, what did you think of this weekend's games? I'm, I look, let me lead in. I'm sorry you're not feeling that well, but you, you, you survived. You're a resilient guy. You have your, is that a Minnesota shirt on there? I, it is my Midwest roots. I, this sweatshirt is like, is damn near 20 years old. I, I got to tell you, um, but it, it's made it with me this whole time. I'm honestly like, I've lost, you know, about 10 pounds over the last like, you know, month or so. I feel good that I can fit into this comfortably um, after all these years. But uh, but yeah, and and uh, Sean Donahue, Sky Yuma, yeah. Look, uh, I wish uh, PJ Fleck, who I like a lot, could uh, manage the clock a little bit better. But I'm still, you know, a Gophers fan. Um, but yeah, thank thank you, for, yeah, you know, very much for the uh, the the acknowledgement of the Minnesota sweatshirt. Well, look to to your point. Loved this weekend. Loved the games. I loved watching them. I was comfortable. Had you know, was really anchored in. It was it was cold here in Atlanta, as everyone knows. Like really, really, you know, mid 16s or whatever it was in the thirties. So it allowed you to feel that much more comfortable, put the fire on and watch a lot of football. That said, there were, there were some unbelievable moments. I can't get it out of my mind. And and I'm not a a so-called softy that way. I mean, this is, this is this business, but watching Tyler Bass, you know, watching that missed field goal, like, you know, you, you, you probably put yourself in there going, gosh, if that was my son, and yet, you know it. That's they signed up for that position. I get it. What a, what a tough situation to be. And uh, you know, I've been in that spot somewhat in that spot before, but not in in that spot that was a whole city. You saw some of those people, the fans in the crowd, crying literally, uh, dudes and and gals. Right? There's a lot going on there. What I'm saying in the end is, I feel for them because the Bills. We could talk about them, right? You want to lead in with the Bills? Let's talk about the whole setup. What, what do yeah, we think of that? Yeah, my college roommate, uh, Kyle Wilcox, was uh, my kicker in college, and he missed a game-winning kick. And uh, I'll just say it was that, that that night it was tough to get him out of his room, and, and they do take it hard. And so uh, that that is part of the game. Yeah, let's talk about the Bills, because there was a, a pretty interesting, um, you know, Alex Hussey, one of our listeners, says Diggs fi- uh, won't finish his contract. It was a couple really big things, right? So the Bills, you know, 2017, they trade back from pick 10, right, to pick, you know, pick 27 with the Chiefs. Obviously, the Chiefs take uh, Patrick Mahomes, right? And, you know, Chief, uh, Bills, they do okay. They take Tredavious White, who's a superstar for them. He's been hurt a, a little bit. Doug Whaley's gone, though, right? 2018, uh, 2017, they go with Sean McDermott. 2018, they go with uh, Brandon Bean. That's been the new regime. Uh, 2018, they draft Josh Allen. 2019 and, and on, they've made the playoffs every single year. 2020 and on, they've won the division every single year. 2020, they made the conference championship. They bowed out to the Chiefs. Every single year since then, they've lost in this round, the divisional round. Wow. And they've gone all in, right? Last year, they gave the big contract to Von Miller. You know, they've before last year, they gave the big contract to Stephon Diggs. They gave the big contract to Josh Allen. And now when you look at them, they have, you know, they're over the cap going into next season. And now when people think about going over the, being over the cap, they don't necessarily know what that means a little bit, right? Because going over the cap means a couple things. You can cut like, like the Los Angeles chargers are when they're over the cap, what it means is they're just going to cut players because of the the structure of the deals. They're going to cut guys like, you know, uh, Cleo Mack, they'll cut guys like Mike Williams, maybe, uh, 
uh, Keenan Allen. The way that the Bills situation is structured is they actually have a decision to make because they can they can't really necessarily get rid of players to get under the cap. What they have to do is kind of more what New Orleans has done, which is kind of push this push things more into the future to get cap relief, right? Because they got to take some of these salaries, which are more or less guaranteed, convert them into bonuses and 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 get cap relief in the present, mm-hmm. which yields more um which gives rise to more uh liabilities in the future the problem with that is those are more older players von miller this season thomas 12 games five total tackles no sacks right stefan diggs this season the last 13 games of this year no 100 yard games yesterday he had under 30 yards receiving in that game and so i fear for this team because you know, they have a young quarterback and he's probably, he was phenomenal yesterday. He, he run, he's so, he's, he's exactly what you want in a quarterback. And, you know, they have some really good young pieces, you know, obviously white coming back from an injury. I think at Oliver, uh, at, uh, he's a good defensive tackle. Um, you know, the running back cook is a, is a good player. Kincaid's a, was a good draft pick, but some of their older pieces, Micah high, Jordan Poyer, guys like that, they're all getting a little older and in order for them to continue to compete, they're going to have to hang on to veterans who I think their better days are beyond them. And I worry for that because I don't think it's going to get much better for them. And they're going to require increasingly more out of a quarterback who I who they're already requiring a ton out of. So there's a lot there. Yeah. By the way, did you see and have you seen anything from the owner, Mr. Pagula? Because... You know, he's a driven, competitive, you know, man. And I've, I've seen him in, uh, in our, uh, you know, over the years in the uh, owners meetings, you know, outspoken, very outspoken. Has there been anything out there towards head coach and GM? I'm not talking about any sort of drastic moves. I'm just saying, has he expressed his discontent for another year, which is unfortunate because those guys, I believe, and I've said this time and again, I believe both Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott are top notch, upper echelon yep. duo, right? That said, you know, a guy like, you know, Pagula, Mr. Pagula would say, like, okay, where are we? What are, what are the next steps here? What else can we really do? We have a stud of a quarterback, to your point. I texted you right away when he fumbled that ball. I thought, oh my God, can you imagine if it ended after a really good game and it ended like that, right? And because he was taking it, I loved what he was doing. He was basically, saying, I am not going to let this end the way that it's ended. And my God, for, for, for Buffalo to see a wide right, that's unbelievable. And I think about it as a former GM and I think about it as a head coach. You leave, you leave that stadium at night and you're thinking, I mean, that is a horrible way to go to sleep, right? What's, what's next? What well, that's is the, next? Well, that's the thing because the hardest part of the whole thing, like you think about this and, and, you know, I, I think about this as far as like, you know, trying to get into shape, right? Or trying to learn something new. You know, when you run, like, let's say you're trying to like run, you're, or you're, you're, you're a biker, right? You try, or you're, you're a, a fitness guy in general. Let's say you're trying to get up to, to biking 25 miles, right? Yeah. The first day you bike 10 miles, the second day you bike 15 miles. Well, the problem is that delta is five miles, but the next day you have to bike the first 10 first and then the next five, right? You don't go out the next day and have to bike the next five. Right. So the hard part I have for the Bills is like, it's not that you have to win the divisional round again. No, you have to play 17 games again. Right. Everybody's got to stay healthy again. Then you got to make, you know, win the wild card round again. Then you got to win. So, like, that's the, like, to your point. And, and I, and I'm guessing this is how, you know, it feels. It's like, not only do you have to go out and win that game against the Chiefs. Right. That, and, and that's where I think everybody gets this wrong. It's the grind isn't just winning the game against the Chiefs. The grind is going back out there and fending off the Dolphins again. Yep. The grind is going out there and fending off the, the Jets, who are going to have Aaron Rodgers again. The grind is going out there and, you know, maybe getting the bye because they've never gotten the bye during this time. And and that, that to me, is where I look at it and I'm like, God, because – you have a good enough quarterback to beat the Chiefs. Like they're three and one against them in the regular season. 
right? They go out, they go to Arrowhead and win. He's won an Arrowhead three times. Like it's it's the it's the grind of the going through the season. And we saw that this year. They were six and six through 12 games. Right. And we and we know that when the chips are down, they can go and actually play great football. And and it's just that by the time you get to the end there, and and we saw it with Kansas City two years ago, or three, yeah, two years ago, the Chiefs had a similar struggle where they were kind of, you know, they were struggling. They 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 went to Tennessee and lost by 24. And and they finally they got it together, but then they get to the final game and Cincinnati beats them because they're just out of gas. Right. Yeah. You you don't you and and I think that that's the problem with Buffalo. But the, what the Chiefs did was they traded Tyreek Hill. They got 10 draft picks in. And I think at some level you have to recycle the roster because the Chiefs needed when they ran it back in 2020. There were there were too many players who were like, we just won the Super Bowl last year. Like we're fed. Right. Like we don't. I think you need to get people on the roster who are who haven't experienced the disappointment that Buffalo has, right? That they're kind of they're kind of uh, numb to what they so that it's not like when the, when Patrick Mahomes goes ninety yards, it's not like oh here we go again. You know what I mean? And I think you saw a little bit of that with the Ravens the other day, where you know the Houston Texans return that kick and it goes in halftime tied. And I think a lot of the crowd was kind of like oh here we go again. The Ravens are going to you know uh, flop in the playoffs again. But the Ravens have recycled. They brought in Roquan. They brought in Pat. Like they brought in enough new blood. Where like no, it's not the same old Ravens. I think you have to do that with Buffalo. Uh, yes, I think you have to do it with Buffalo. And then I, I look. I don't want to change subjects here because here because it gets me heated up thinking about it. And then I start going over to the the interaction that I was getting texts from a lot of different people. Right, and I love I love a number of people in in the Chiefs. Can I just go over here for a minute? And we can yeah. come back to this because this is very important to talk about. When you're building teams, it's vital to make sure you're building with a focus and limit disruptions. And every time we turn around, we've talked about it. We see the Kansas City Chiefs, the quarterback, the head coach, the tight end, and more, et cetera, et cetera, in commercials. And it's really starting to wear on a lot of people, right? Not to mention, you know, Travis's girlfriend, who every time something happens, what I think is interesting back to right the idea of the emperor's got no clothes is anyone really sharing that with them and is the reality if people took a toll a poll excuse me as good as they are and a lot of people like i like ted cruz i love ted cruz one of my favorites you know how you know ted's navigating through all of this with all of this going on has it truly affected so i think it was funny i felt like there were a lot of people that were hoping that kansas city wasn't going to pull it off for that reason to say see you're getting away from yourselves. Go back to who you are because you have all of these other things going on. I don't believe that. I'm just saying there's a there's a there's an interesting bubbling up here of, you know, an agitation with like and I don't know, does it have everything to do with a mega superstar who's taking over the United the football in the United States? I don't know. But yeah, I, I think I think they're letting that fuel them. So like I watched the game I see. on Christmas and it was a very much a like you look at that sideline, it was it was awful. But then you watch the week 18, right? So they won against the Bengals, they clinched the division, they clinched the three seed, and then week 18, they sat Travis down. And and you watch the season, and Travis Kelsey looked like very slow and very injured. Well, he he got a bone bruise in his knee in week one, sat, and then played the whole season. Like that took a toll. He Right. This season has been marred, I think, by and I think sometimes unfairly by selfish ac uh, accusations of selfishness on the part of the Chiefs. Right. Like that has been the whole thing. Like Tony Junji said it the other day, blah, 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 blah. Right. Mm -hmm. So what did Travis Kelsey do? Travis Kelsey has been at the center of all this. Travis was 16 yards away from his what eighth consecutive thousand yard season. Huge. So what did he do in week 18? He sat down. He did not go after the per individual accolade, right? He sat down, right? Wasn't active for that game. Yep. Now, on the other side of the coin, though, Chris Jones, who was going after, a, I think, like a million two five, and he was rushing the passer, trying to get that last sack to get 10 sacks to go after that incentive. But the whole chief sideline, from what I can tell, and, I, and I'm, I'm good friends with a few uh, of the beat reporters and columnists in Kansas City, they were so elated for Chris Jones 
like there have been a couple of inflection points for this team where I think that there have been some energ energizing moments for this club right. where they've allowed the hatred, right? And you have been a part of this, right? You were part of the Patriot, yeah. Patriot paradigm. You won two Super Bowl rings with them where they've allowed the, the public hate because the Patriots in 01, everybody loved that, right? 9-11, they're, they're called the Patriots, right? We all love the Patriots in 01, right? But eventually the Patriots became a hated team, right? And then Spygate happened and all this right. nonsense. Everybody hated the Patriots. And to a certain extent, Tom Brady and company allowed that to fuel them. And you could tell Patrick Mahomes running off the field. The Bills fans are throwing snowballs at him. Like, I think they allowed this to fuel them. But I think Travis Kelsey in a year where people, I think, accused him, again, probably unfairly of selfishness, sitting down in week 18, not taking the individual accolade, and coming out and playing his two best games of the season physically – in, in the two playoff games, because he sat down and helped himself physically, I think has obviously helped this team because their offense has actually been really good for once the last two weeks. And, you know, and, and they're going to have a tough matchup. I mean, the Baltimore Ravens pass defense is one of the best that we've seen in, in modern NFL. Um, but, but they're, they're you know, uh, they needed it all of it yesterday because their defense didn't play great. I guess what I'm saying, it's, it's a great dialogue. And like I said, Ted Cruz, whoever's in charge of – helping all of that from, from an owner who I think is the very best and the GM who I think is one of the very best. Of course, we know that the head coach is. I think what's agitating people out there in the football world and uh, around is, okay, yes, there were a lot of anti-New England people over the years, but there was also a control at that time that, you know, Bill would never allow the commercials and et cetera, et cetera. I think people get jealous, right? The, yeah. the hatred is fueled by every time they turn a TV on, some some chief is on the television, right? Even, you know, where I just find it interesting that people are like, ah, you know, F this, F that, screw this, screw that. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. They are a damn good football team. Okay, maybe they shouldn't. Maybe, they're, maybe they've been, you know, uh, there, there's been some, um, you know, some sort of hindrance of their focus. Okay, deep breaths now. They win this game and now they focus, right? It's not, it's, they're not doing those commercials right now they were done in the off season, right? right? Exactly. It's just, it's again, people think, wow. I mean, how distracted are they? And look, that's why they're doing this, they're that, but there's, they still won and they're on their way to your point. So I guess all I'm saying in the end is it's amazing to see, like you said, the hatred from it for a team that is really kind of a Midwest, really solid sound team led by some sound people, but it's, it's perceived because these, all of the big, approach to all this is much bigger and especially because of Taylor Swift, right? It just takes it to another level. I've even heard women say, screw that. Ah, it, make, it makes me sick. I'm like, wait a minute. I've heard you say like five weeks ago that you, my daughters you want to watch the games because of her. I know. I know. It's like, I, I think it's great for the league. Of course. Um, we had a good question from my friend, thankfully yeah. difficult. He says, um, could the chiefs this not have paid, Chris Jones, the bonus and sat him. I think they can. I, I don't know if that's actually true. Like, can you pay a bonus? Are you, I think you're allowed to write pay. If he has an incentive in his contract for a certain statistic, are you allowed to pay that out? I think that they're up against the cap enough where if it's like one of those likely to be earned situations, it is touchy, right? It's touchy, but I want to make sure I understand that question. Do you want to bring so, it up? So again? he had, so, so he had, um, so Chris Jones had nine and a half sacks going into week 18. He had a $1.25 million bonus um, if he got to 10 sacks or more. And so he played to get that, that sack. Yeah. And so he gets the bonus. Could the chiefs have just paid him that money as like a bonus and sat him to, to preserve him for the playoffs. Even if he court. didn't get, even if he didn't. Achieve. Exactly. Just basically yeah. sat him and paid him. No, you have to achieve that. You have to achieve that 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 marker I, right i think i think that there's a i think that some teams do that but i think the chiefs are up against the cap enough and there's a there's a thing there's a cap and we have to go to chase on this but like there's a likely to be earned and not likely to be earned classification where if if it's a not likely to be earned it gets prorated to the next year and i think that that's how it, that's how it gets accounted for in the chief's cap and so you know that I think that if they were to do that, it would be applied to this year, and so then they would be screwed if they wanted to like sign somebody uh, during the playoffs to like 
deal with an injury right now. And they're dealing with like a Joe Tooney injury, for example, uh, which could be which could be a problem. Um, Let's get it clear. So we're, we're giving the right information out. I guess we can we can probably tweet it out. Right. Or you can. Yes. Yeah. We can go down the hallway here and confirm that. What if, if I'm following what you're asking? Yeah. So so basically they're just asking. Yeah, they're asking if if um, you can pay an incentive out, e- even if he doesn't achieve it. And I, and I, there have been teams that have done it before. And, and the question is, is I believe it's, it's, it's basically how it's accounted for under the cap. If you do that. Yes. But you, you can't just say you, you, that's like giving someone extra money. If you didn't, if you didn't achieve 10 and he was only at eight or nine, that that's dicey. And we've been in that before. And that's a fine line. Like you said, I'm sure there, there's always ways around certain things, but it's also nebulous, and that's like, hey, I'm giving a bonus, but we're not really accounting for it. Here's another. That we've had that before. We've had it on both sides, right? Yeah. Well, at least when I was in Atlanta, it's like, you know, let's just give it to them for morale purposes. You can't just do that. Well, and, and you can't give it to everybody. Well, and the old the whole point of the Chris Jones thing was like, you're sort of holding the line because you you held the line all off season, and then you cave at the end it, again. It. You know, Chris Jones is a special player for them, so it it, it it could be it could be tenuous. Okay, we only we only have about 15 minutes left, so let's let's talk about the openings right now. So just to get people up to speed, Las Vegas takes the interim tag away from Antonio Pierce. He is their head coach. New England hires Gerard Mayo as a part of the uh, um, as a part of the apprentice. You know, he was basically the heir apparent to Bill Belichick in contract. So. You know, they didn't have to really interview everybody. Those have been the two. Um, there have been you know rumors that Ben Johnson is linked to Washington, but that is not confirmed, and they are still interviewing people. So we're not going to go with that. Um, Bill Belichick has interviewed multiple times with Atlanta, but so is Jim, Jim Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh has interviewed multiple times with the Los Angeles Chargers. And then Tennessee and Seattle have interviewed multiple people as well. On the GM front, Adam Peters is the GM of the Washington Commanders, although they have not done anything with Martin Mayhew, who still has the title of GM. So there's two people that have the title of GM in Washington. Uh, Carolina is reported today that they are closing in on making their current assistant GM, Dan Morgan, the GM, and making Brant Tillis, the, cur- the current VP of Football Operations with the, with the Kansas City Chiefs, the senior VP of Football Operations with the Panthers. But again, that's not confirmed. That's just the rumor. And then we have Las Vegas has not picked a GM yet. Uh, which other one are we? Uh, and then the Los Angeles Chargers not have not picked a GM yet. A lot of wide open races here, Thomas. Uh, which one intrigues you the most? Oh my gosh, I'm sitting there listening to you go from. I mean, at seven or eight or nine or whatever you're doing, I'm like, that's your mathematical mind. I'm like, me compartmentalize. I'm like, let's take one at a time. But you don't want to do that, of course. You decided you're going to throw it out there. Which one intrigues me most? I, wow. Where do you want to start? I mean, look, I'm we're in Atlanta. I don't want to stay too long on this topic. It's amazing to see how things are are flying around here. Let's let's just talk about Bill Belichick quickly. The fact that he is, as we've said before, you know, the the an unbelievable acquisition out there. Never in in my mind again. I don't think there's a never going to be an opportunity again to have a Hall of Fame coach with such stature and such ability as Bill Belichick for this group of owners and this group of general managers. I don't think it comes around. It just doesn't come around. It's very, very rare that that person doesn't, you know, retire. He's not. And I think there's there is talk out there that, you know, would he be in it for two years? To me, I think that's ridiculous. He's not in it just to be in it. For two years. I don't believe that. I think the opportunity for a team, whether it's Atlanta or not, whoever it is, I think they can do, you know, I, I think it's it's unbelievable that there wouldn't be um, more teams or not more teams. Like, where is he going to land and, and what is he going to do for that team? He helps bring them the closest to being a Super Bowl champion, I think, in the next three to four years than anyone. Not that there's not other great coaches out there and opportunities. So I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time on Atlanta just because it's not my place to be commenting on that, yeah. as you know. But it's interesting. Where else? Where else is it? So go ahead. You're about ready. Yeah, to I, I think I think the interesting one is New England, right? Who yes. doesn't appear with Belichick gone, right? Belichick is a humongous character as far as 
that history of that franchise. Yep. 2000 is when he started. You know, obviously they had Pioli, they had you, they had, you know, um, yeah. I mean, and then when Pioli left and you left, he's kind of been the guy there, you know, running personnel. And they're now, there's now rumors that they're going to basically wait until after the draft to have a general manager, if at all, right? Mm -hmm. where, where they're going to have some guys possibly, you know, kind of tag team the draft. And and I actually, frankly, and this is a good question, I, I, I kind of want to get your opinion on this. I actually don't hate the idea of, you know, if you're a first-time general manager, now you might disagree because you knocked your first draft out of the park and kind of set yourself up for, for your success. But do you – because you're kind of taking over, right – and you're kind of probably using somebody else's grades, somebody else's scouts, right? If you're, if you're, there is like some, I think, merit to kind of pulling back a little bit, maybe trading back a little bit. And, you know, using that first draft as an information gathering session, as opposed to going all in. Like, what do you think about the Patriots approach that they're using right now, which is to kind of slow playing this thing and, and waiting maybe uh, to use sort of like the whole, you know, basically waiting a year before they hire a GM. Well, as you know, they have Matt Grow there right now, right? Matt is very adept at what he does. He's a really good football mind, having been grown up with his dad being a head coach at, at, at the University of Virginia and in other places, of course. He's got brothers. He knows it well. I'm sure the Crafts, Craft family, you know, Robert and Jonathan have a really good feel for what they're what they have in place already. And their feeling is they already have the draft and free agency well underway that they can ride that wave to the other side of it. Like you said, maybe get more people in there to help out a little bit. I mean, that's ultimately going to be up to what they believe, how far along they are with their, you know, with the free agency set up and with their draft set up. So I don't think it's out of, you know, out of control thinking, wow, are they really going to proceed through the spring and get to the, you know, get to the fall or get to the uh, end of the spring and make a decision. I think of all places, this is one of the places that I think could pull that off. Right. Cause it, they're hiring a coach that's within their system. I think that's sound. When you start looking at some of these other places, people are asking me back to, you know, GMs being in place at certain places, GMs being replaced. There's a difference there, right? We can talk a little bit about this. And I, and I can go round and round about this. If you're a first time general manager or you're a fairly very young general manager in the world, do you want, I'm going to throw this out to you. you. You haven't had this hat on, but would you want a head coach coming in who is the dude, or do you want to be able to have a, have more of a, you know, a shoulder to shoulder relationship with that head coach? Meaning you're, you're Adam Peters. Let's use that as an example. Mm -hmm. Does Adam want, Coach Belichick to come up there, or does Adam, and that's not fair to put it on Adam, but hypothetically, or does Adam want Ben Johnson to come up there because two young guys in their positions growing together? I had that with Mike Smith. It was what I wanted at that time. I will tell you, as the years went on, I would be a lot more comfortable, of course, because you're security and you understand where you are. I would, it would be a lot easier for me to deal with, not just deal, that's the wrong word, to coexist with a really, really sound, big power type of a head coach, knowing what you guys both know, because there's a confidence there. Some would argue otherwise. Wow, I don't want two power hitters at the top. It's just going to be butting heads. Well, I think that's a really interesting conversation. I think some of it is your experience too, right? Like Peter's, right? His experience is looking at Lynch and Shanahan, mm -hmm. who, you know, when they were hired in San Francisco, it's two guys were hired at the same same length contract and then they they both had the same length contract every time they got an extension and they were both first time gm head coach right and they they had a thematic consistency the whole time so if i were him which i'm not but if i were him i'd probably want the ben johnson character right because you've seen this thing modeled before and so you probably have the best idea of how that works relative to seeing like sort of the parcells belichick kind of that alpha male, you know, that alpha guy coming in and you being the subservient guy. Now, you've been in way more rooms, so you probably would be able to navigate that situation. But Peters has only, uh, maybe he's seen more, but he's yeah. seen like that model successfully in San Francisco that way. And so yeah. my guess would be the preference would be that. Um, 
if you're somebody like Brant Tillis, right, and you're going, you know, and you've seen in in Kansas City, you've seen the Pioli, you know, see, seen the Pioli and the, and the Haley right away, where that 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 parallelism didn't work, right? And then you see Reed and Dorsey, and you know, Reed won the power struggle, and then Brett Veach kind of earned his way to the kind of equal, but it's still kind of Andy Reed's world and everybody else is living in it. Maybe, maybe it's less that way. Right. And maybe you're more comfortable in a situation where the head coach gets more control than, than not, you know what I'm saying? So I think a lot of times you kind of, you know, just the same way as in academia, right? Like if you have a PhD advisor who likes to meet daily, you might be a PhD advisor who wants your students to meet daily. It's a, it's the sort of, it's the same way, I think. So you, yeah, you've hit it on all of those. There's, it's really, really interesting to see how this is going to play out. Again, you have Rand Carthon in Tennessee. Where is he going to be? Who is he going to go after? And yeah. when you start seeing the people that they're interviewing and, and my feeling is after Mike Vrabel's be there, it has been there and he's a very powerful, strong willed guy who has a presence is it a natural inclination for an organization and a GM to say, let's get a younger guy here. We can work together. We can coexist. Very interesting. But then I start thinking about the young guys versus the established guys. And I think of a guy who is very different. I think about a guy like Dan Quinn. Dan Quinn can go both ways from the standpoint of a young GM. He could work really well with the young GM, Eric, and he can also work very well with the GM that's been around because he understands both sides of it. He understands that the, I mean, Dan is a very good coexisting person, right? He coexists well. He communicates very, very well. And I think that's a positive for whoever. If he goes up, John Snyder is existing longtime GM. He could kick butt with him up there, but I also think he could go in and work with Dan Morgan as a potential, you know, first time executive, whatever ends up happening there. If Brant Tillis is the GM there and, and Dan is an assistant uh, uh, sorry, associate or one of the VPs of personnel. That's a blockbuster threesome in my mind, what they got going there. And, and Dan is the type of, type of guy that could work in that situation. And then yeah. you think about Mike Vrabel very quickly. Mike's got a strong suit about him, right? Mike's not just going in and he's not just going to be, hey, I'm going to come in and, and listen to, you know, a, a 40-year-old general manager. And that, it's bad to put ages. So that has to be the right spot. Just like Jim, Jim Harbaugh is not going in and after his time with Trent Baalke, he's got to pick his ownership and he's got to pick his general manager situation right. When you go in as a head coach in today's world, there is a lot of discussion about who your GM is going to be, wherever it is. Put, put, put Coach Belichick aside for a minute. Whatever they're looking at in Atlanta, there's a lot of discussion there, as you can imagine. What happens with the internal there already, Right. They've already stated that they are keeping Terry Fontenot in that role. Terry's a good man. A lot of people like him in the building, et cetera, et cetera. Who comes in there and how does that, how does that build? How does that, how does that grow, right? That's a really important thing for a, G, for a head coach. If Mike Vrabel knocks on the door in Atlanta, you know, and, you know, how, do, how does that, how do they approach that? How does Mike inquire about how that all, all works out? It's, it's really interesting. Yeah, and, and – Right. And, and if you're ter and if you're Terry, like, how do you, how do you handle that situation? Do you, are you relieved? But the fact that it's not Belichick, but Rabel might be equally, you know, Rabel might be equally powerful at, in the end of the day. And so it might be, it might be equally difficult for you, even though you thought that at first, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it it's a really tough situation. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's an interesting it's a very interesting uh, situation. I do think that one of these very good and, and before we have to go here, one of the very so there's a ton of very good candidates, right? You think about Harbaugh, obviously Brable, you have Belichick, Quinn, and then you have some of the young and then Raheem Morris, who I think Henry. is, is a, yep. a very good. And then you have the two new guys, I think, obviously Johnson and Mike McDonald, who I think put on a, a clinic the other day for the Ravens. He'll have a big test against Patrick Mahomes this weekend. I, I I think, unfortunately, one of those guys is going to get left out, or two of those guys. One or two of those guys are going to get left out. It'll be interesting to see which one is that person because, you know, sometimes we saw this with Ron Rivera two decades ago. Ron Rivera kept getting left out, like, every single year. And then eventually 
he got the job like you know four or five years later. Eric Bieniemy was that guy that kept getting left out. Ben Johnson took a big chance this year by by staying as a coordinator. It very much looks like he's going to get a job this year, but you know it is tough sometimes when you are that like hotshot coordinator. And, you know, those jobs happen and you are it's kind of that N plus first. You're sort of that, you know, that that last person in the musical chairs. Uh, it'll it'll uh, you know, it remains to be seen whether or not, uh, you know, all those men will get the job that they want because, you know, there's only so many so many gigs. But it, it is interesting with Belichick as well that it, it does seem like Atlanta is the one job that he's been linked to. If that one doesn't work out, I'm, I'm interested to see where, you know, which team comes calling because, that that so far has been the one job he's been linked to. Well, look, I, I think there it's going to just be really, really interesting. To your point earlier, what a great group! I, I don't normally throw around great, but I mean, in 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 the scope of it all, what a really great group to be picking from, right? For all of these owners and 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 you know the the sort of selection group for these teams, this isn't just a couple randos here and there. Like this no. is. This is legitimate. So, yeah. you know, it's going to be there's really no, interesting to see. There's no wah, wah, wah hires. Let's just put it that way. No, yeah, among not. these. So. And they and, all and have the their hires either. No, exactly. And they all have their, their amazing positives, and they all have some of their challenges that people got have to ask answer the questions, right? G, you know, Dan Quinn goes in, he answers questions about an, an historic loss in the Super Bowl. Of course he does. You know? Mike Vrabel comes in and answers the questions about, hey, man, you know, what was the power struggle there, right? Um, Jim Harbaugh, great coach, as we all know. He comes in. They're going to ask questions. I know what happened with Trent Baalke back in the day, your last, you know, um, you know, there's just there's going to be questions that need to be answered. And, and part of your job as one of these coaches is to go in, be very honest, not throw darts, be as honest as you can. That's what these groups want to know. They don't want people throwing darts. You know, Raheem Morris, Raheem, I mean, Raheem deserves another chance in this league. And you know that we, we've talked about it, right? Mm -hmm. 100%. And he's going to have to answer the questions, but those questions were 12 years ago, right? That man has learned. He's changed. He's changed. That's right. Uh, He's evolved certainly with the game as well. So this has been a great show. We thank you all for coming. Um, thank you all for the great comments uh, and your patience with my voice. Uh, hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Um, tell somebody about the show. For Thomas Dimitrov, for Eric Eager, we'll see you on Wednesday. This has been the Sumer Sports Show.